in my view, Christians have rarely embarrassed themselves so much as when we, I'll include myself, <laughs> we get things wrong when it comes to Bible prophecy and about the future, uh, when we make predictions based upon misinterpreted passages, and it's been happening a lot, and I, I'm, I can guarantee you it's going to happen a lot more in the coming years, and I'll explain why as we continue through today's study. But right now we're in Mark chapter 13. This is where Jesus explains things. And the section we're in today is things that are not signs of his coming. And regularly people say these things are signs of his coming. And I say regularly like it it was ingrained in me from the teaching I had received uh, as a young Christian that these things are signs of his coming, earthquakes and pandemics and all that sort of thing. But as I do verse by verse studies through the Bible, I encounter those passages and I go, wait a minute. He's literally saying the exact opposite of what I thought he was here. So I want to start by saying this. First, welcome. Uh, I'm Pastor Mike Winger, trying to help you learn to think biblically about everything uh, because the Bible is more brilliant and beautiful and wonderful and life-changing than just about anybody realizes. And I'm going to help help you all realize it a little bit more. It's one of my goals. So <clears throat> um, when we uh, approach the topic of what's going to happen in our future, we do tend to make some missteps. We tend to assume that the end times are like when I say end times, I mean the fulfillment of biblical prophecy about the final days, that that's all happening right now. We tend to assume that. Every generation seems to assume that. This leaves a track record of weird little moments in people who would otherwise be good, good godly teachers. And I'll be talking a little bit more about this as we continue on in the Mark series. As we go through Mark 13, I'll talk about what I think is probably one of the most embarrassing moments for Calvary Chapels, which I'm a Calvary Chapel pastor uh, in our history. And that's related to this. Um, I think it creates great conf confusion and embarrassment. And so what I'm asking here is not that we approach it like uh, just with a critical attitude towards people who are predicting the YouTube prophets who are <laughs> predicting all kinds of things right now. Like it's a whole genre on YouTube now is a bunch of made up prophecy stuff that just drives me nuts, right? Now there's real prophecy and I'm totally open to that, but there's a whole genre of people who are just faking things and it's been stirred up and encouraged by various groups and blah. You know what I'm talking about. Um, or maybe you don't. Maybe you haven't fallen that YouTube rabbit hole yet. So, I'm, But I'm not just wanting to be critical of that while we are right, rightfully critical of that. What I want to do is actually have some self-awareness and say, okay, if there's an area where my theology is most prone to error, it's probably in discussions about interpreting the book of Revelation, in understanding what the distant future might hold. Um, I mean, there's some things that are ironclad. Jesus is going to come back. He's going to reign physically and bodily on you know, in an eternal kingdom, right? Where the new heaven and new earth are created. We, we know this is for sure. And this is like not a debatable thing. That's not like, I wonder if that'll happen. But, but it's the stuff that happens between now and then that people just get weird on. And, <clears throat> and, and, and I can do it and you can do it. And when we're in crazy upheavals, like we are right now, where the world is, is, is weird and strange and odd, and it feels different, you know, it's at these times when people start to just connect the dots in ways where maybe they weren't intended to be connected and they say weird things. Now, what we're going to get into today is how Jesus anticipated this. He, he This is crazy when I think about this. He anticipated people falsely predicting the end, the second coming, put it that way. He anticipated it and he warned us against it and we've taken those warnings and we've turned them into predictions that are the opposite of what Jesus actually meant. So now there are different views as we hit Mark 13 right now, and I'm going to read the whole passage for us. We're going to do what we normally do with our methodical Bible studies. We're going to read through it carefully and then go back over it verse by verse. <clears throat> but I want to warn you ahead of time, there's different views. Some people think Mark, Mark 13, Jesus' little apocalypse, some people call it. I, I don't really care for that term, but it's because it's about this future, you know, second coming and uh, craziness that happens in the world around that time. Some people think it's only about 70 A.D., um, these people think that everything that Jesus is saying is just about 70 AD. The whole context of Mark 13 and then the, the parallel passages in Matthew and Luke where he's, he's sharing similar content, that it's just 70 AD. 70 AD was the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, and they'll see the fulfillment of all of this stuff there. Uh, personally, I don't think that's a, a viable view, in my opinion. Could, be, could I be wrong? I, um, well, not entirely wrong because <laughs> the second coming seems to be in there too. But um, <clears throat> some people think though the opposite. They think Mark 13 and the parallel passages are just about the, the second coming. They're just about the distant, far distant future from the time of Jesus when Christ will return. And there are some problems with that because when Jesus talks, it, it sounds like he's addressing the, a question about the temple being destroyed. And we'll explain that in a minute. 
So they would say, this is this is not about the temple. This is about the far distant future. It just coincidentally sounds kind of like the temple. And I'm not really favorable to that view either. Um, then there's my view. And a lot of people share this view. Not everybody. But I think it's about both. Um, I think Jesus talks about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and his second coming. And there's good reason for him to do this. Uh, partly because the disciples did see all of these things as just the end, right? Like it was all, they just thought it was all going to happen around the same time. Even in the Old Testament, they often spoke about the first and second coming of Christ without breaks, without visible breaks. Okay. So there's that, but then there's also the fact that in Mark 13, there are visible breaks as well as in Luke and in Matthew in the parallel passages. I think it's the most consistent way to take it. Of course, I think I'm right. You think you're right. I think I'm right. That's that everybody always thinks they're right until they change their mind and then they think they're right again. So I will say this, <clears throat> while I'm going to be ripping on, <laughs> in a gracious, hopefully brotherly way, ripping on what I think is an abuse, a misunderstanding of Jesus, his teachings here, and it's being used to promote um, weird prophecy stuff going on around us. Um, I do want to have some grace about this and say this is an in-house discussion. How we handle the details between now and the second coming of Christ is a very much an in-house discussion. Christians disagree on these issues. They always have. There is no one Christian view on the end times. And so we need to be gracious. We need to be, treat this like an in-house discussion where we can, we can disagree even adamantly, even vigorously, but not divisively. That's all. Not divisively. So here we are, Mark 13. Let's read through the passage. And what I want to ask you to do <clears throat> is I'm going to read 13 verses straight through. I just want you to be aware of your preloaded interpretations. That is, as you hear some of these sentences, some of these statements of Jesus, I want you to be aware if you already have an interpretation in your mind. It doesn't mean you're wrong. I'm, not at all. You just want to be aware of the difference between this, what the text is saying and what you're thinking it's meaning. So here we are, verse 1. As he was going out of, his t out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately. Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? And Jesus began to say, See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he and will mislead many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs, but be on your guard. For they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. The gospel must first be preached to all the nations. When they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and the father and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. <clears throat> and, the, and I'm going to pause here. We'll pick up on verse 14 next week, the abomination desolation. What is that about? But what I want to ask you is this. You had your interpretations loaded in your head. Of the verses we just read, what in there was a, 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 um, a sign of the second coming? What of all the things Jesus said was an actual sign of something he, he's you know, to look for when Christ is, is going to return? And you might be thinking earthquakes, or you might be thinking wars, rumors of wars. Actually, the opposite is true. Jesus says these are all just things that will happen. The end is not yet. So I want to dispel, if that's the tradition as I grew up in, okay, I'm disagreeing with many of the people who I looked up to teaching me as I was a young Christian. I think that they took these verses out of context and misused them. And it was only when I was studying and reading verse by verse, reading whole books of the Bible, just kind of plodding through, not even to teach it, just reading it that I went, wait a minute, I've heard that verse quoted to say the opposite of what Jesus is saying here. And uh, let's talk about it. So here we are, <clears throat> our verse by verse study. And if you guys are interested in, in uh, catching this, the entire Mark series, the playlist for every video as I go verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark is down below. We cover theology, apologetics, history, ap um, all kinds of all kinds of interesting things there. It's a beautiful, amazing, brilliant, uh, brilliant, brilliant book. And the more you dig, the more you find. 
Mark 13, 1, as he was going out of the temple, one of the disciples said to him, teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. This is like a pretty typical thing for people to do when they visit Israel back, back at that time is they come and they look at the temple and they go, it is so beautiful. It is so wonderful. It's so amazing. And they just, they just look at it even now, like, okay, well, let me explain the reason why they said stones, what beautiful stones is that Herod, King Herod, this is the guy who tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby, right? King Herod was, was like a builder. He tried to build things for his glory and the glory of Rome. You're like, but he was a Jewish king. Well, he was really more Roman than Jewish, but he was technically the Jewish king. And he, he took the temple, what was the second temple, and he rebuilt it, renovated it, expanded it, made it much, much larger. And he added these massive stones. I mean, stones that are like as big as a truck, a giant, solid stone. And he had these stones carved and then brought in and placed in, in, into the temple. And he also built up the Temple Mount. Now, the Temple Mount is just a big platform because Jerusalem is mountainside. It, things go up and down. Streets go up and down. So they built a large flat area for the temple and the courtyards around it and the shops that he installed. Lots of shops to sell things that they installed as well. So it was normal. This thing's beautiful. It's covered in gold. It's, it's gorgeous. And it's a hugely impressive sight. It's like a wonder of the world at the time. So, of course, they're like, look at the stones. Even now, if you're a traveler and you go to Israel, like, you will find, you're, you know, you do like a, a guided tour, as I've done a couple times. Um, not guiding, me being on a guided tour. You will actually find that as you get to Jerusalem, they will stop and they will just stay there at, not the temple, because the temple's gone. It's been destroyed in 70 AD, all gone. But they will look at the platform that also has these giant stones. And they'll just point to the stones. They'll talk about how many tons they are and how big they are and how they might have gotten them in there and up there, you know, using ancient uh, machinery. And so this is this is something we still do today. Like, look at those wonderful stones. Like 2,000 years later, they're still doing it just about the platform now. So it's natural for them to make a big deal about it. The temple was glorious. This is what travelers do. But Jesus then says something that is totally shocking to them. And if you want to understand Jesus' prophecy, you've got to understand the context in which he gave it, right? He says, do you, not, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. I mean, this isn't something you generally even do, right? Gigantic stones, you don't generally tear them down. But that is actually what happened in 70 AD. Jesus is giving a prediction. And it's hard to say this isn't about the prediction of the destruction of the temple because Jesus identifies which buildings, right? The ones they are looking at, they're at the Mount of Olives, which is a perfect place to view the temple from. You could just look right across and see it. It's a great, it's the picture spot for taking pictures of the temple, so to speak. And he's looking at that temple. He says, these buildings, their stones will be taken apart. They will be destroyed. So this is obviously about 70 AD. I don't understand anybody who could deny that. That, that doesn't seem to make sense to me. Um, I'm not saying that they're irrational human beings in general, but I don't think that makes sense as an interpretation. So this is obviously Jesus is saying something about 70 AD. This was 40 years ahead of time, right? Approximately 40 years ahead of time, Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple. This has actually caused some people to say that Mark must have been written, some people, not, not, not everybody, but that Mark must have been written after 70 AD because it involves a very detailed prediction about the temple. Because it's not just the destruction of the temple, it's its disassembling. It just seems strange, you know? Rome liked the temple. They liked temples in general. It brought them uh, you know, glory, the glory of Rome, you know, and they, they didn't destroy other religious views. They, they adopted them into their pantheon. This created problems with the Jews who wouldn't accept the pantheon. So they had this like tense relationship with the Jewish people. And then Josephus, the first century historian, he talks about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And he goes into details about um, how like it wasn't Rome's fault. And it, it almost sounds like he's trying to offer a defense that people might be mad at Caesar, at Titus, who was the general later Caesar, the guy who was in charge at the destruction of the temple. It sounds kind of like Josephus is trying to defend him against accusations that he destroyed this amazing building. Um, but Josephus puts all the all the blame on the on the soldiers. He goes, Titus told him to stop, but they wouldn't stop, and the and the house got set on fire, and then it all and there's there was wood in in, in between the stones. Um, anyway, it all burned down, and tons of tapestries and stuff. And then it looks like, for some reason, they threw all the stones of the building off of the platform. The only stones that remain from the temple in the first century are that are actually from the temple itself, potentially, are ones that are just on a pile of stones that are unceremoniously just tossed off the platform. 
and the Temple Mount, and they're just sitting there. You see them on your way to the Western Wall if you go to Jerusalem. You walk past this pile of stones, and it's like, if there are any stones from the Old Temple, it's that pile right there, down here at the bottom of the platform, not up there where it once was. So yeah, um, obviously it's special pleading uh, to, uh, or circular reasoning perhaps, to say that Jesus wasn't or Mark was written after 70 AD because Jesus has an accurate prophecy here. <laughs> you have to you have to assume that Christ Christianity is not true in order to make the case for that. So that would be a bad reason to date Mark uh, past 70 AD. Um, at any rate, there we are. This is now a theme in Mark. Under, let's understand the significance of the temple in the Gospel of Mark. This is stuff that I don't know until I study it a lot, you know, in detail. But um, these are some of the nuggets that you get when you spend a lot of time uh, in the text. So. The church in the Gospel of Mark, even in the Gospel of Mark, not just the book of Acts, not just the epistles, the church is going to become the new temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is seen in Mark in various ways. The, the way in which the church is seen as the new temple, it starts at the very beginning. John the Baptist, he is, <clears throat> he is preaching forgiveness, right? John the Baptist comes before Christ, the forerunner. He preaches forgiveness. But what you have to understand is to the Jewish mindset back then, what he's doing is really weird because he's preaching forgiveness and he, there's no mention of the temple and there's no mention of a sacrifice. He's like, you just, you just get in the water, right? You get, <clears throat> you repent, you're baptized and then you move on. So this is just like really shockingly strange for them. What about the temple? Where's the place of the temple in, in being the thing where the atonement takes place? Then John though, he's not preaching forgiveness apart from sacrifice altogether. It's just not happening through the temple, right? Because then Jesus shows up and what does John call him? John calls him the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus is the lamb. He's the sacrifice. He's the offering. So he's the one who's the sacrifice for all of the people to just repent and believe, to be forgiven just by faith. This is powerful. Then John goes on and says that Jesus is going to baptize us with the Holy Spirit, right? He baptizes with water. Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit. But in the first century, in Judaism, you have to understand that the Holy Spirit only permanently dwells in one location, the temple. So here we have forgiveness through a sacrifice that doesn't happen at the temple. We have the giving of the Spirit to human beings. Then what purpose is the temple now? And so you see the foreshadowing here of the of, of how Jesus replaces the need for the temple. Rather, I would say it better is better to use the word fulfill, right? He fulfills the need for the temple. He he is the sacrifice. He the temple's the shadow, he's the substance. The temple's the prediction, he's the fulfillment, to put it that way. <clears throat> then in Mark chapter eleven. We have this epic moment where Jesus comes to the temple. This was foreshadowed earlier on in Mark when uh, Mark quotes in Mark 1, 2, he quotes Malachi 3, 1. I, I hope I'm not losing you here. And this, the, the quote is to say the Old Testament predicted that John the Baptist was going to come and prepare the way of the Lord. The strange thing about Malachi 3, 1, if you read the rest of the verse, is that the, the, the way is being prepared for Yahweh, right? For God Almighty. And then it says in 3, 1, Yahweh is going to come to his temple. And this is what Jesus does eventually in Mark. That Mark only has one temple uh, attendance of Jesus recorded to highlight this fact, right? He doesn't even talk about the other times Jesus went to the temple, even though he went probably every Passover. He doesn't talk about that because, I mean, every Passover of his life probably he went. And <clears throat> doesn't doesn't mention it because there's just an emphasis on the one visit because it's like the temple visit of Yahweh coming to his temple. Then Jesus does something <clears throat> in one of my favorite studies I've done in the Mark series. Um, he does something, the one that has Kenneth Copeland on the picture of it, which is not the reason why it's my favorite. Um, <clears throat> he does something that shows that the temple will be replaced because he enters the temple. He finally visits the temple, Mark eleven seventeen. 17. He complains. He says that, you know, my house shall be a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. So he complains about the temple. It's not being used in its function for prayer. Then he turns to his disciples and he inaugurates a new way of prayer that's not through that temple, but is through his name because Jesus is the one who fulfills the purpose of the temple. So, and then turns us into the corporate temple of the Holy Spirit. So he inaugurates prayer in his name. He's like, now you'll pray in my name. And this is the Kenneth Copeland passage that's taken out of context and used to be like, you can kind of almost command God in, 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 the, in the worst versions of the use, misuse of the passage. But really he's inaugurating prayer in his name, that his disciples will be these spirit-filled people who can pray directly to God and not through the temple, which is, is there to illustrate the constant separation of sin between man and God, we can't come close. There's, there's veils and there's buildings and there's people and there's degrees of separation. All that's gone in Christ. So boom, we're the new temple. So then when Jesus says like, look at that temple, it's all going to be destroyed. This is part of the overall theology in Mark as well as the New Testament 
teaching us that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit now, that it served a purpose, but now we're the fulfillment of that thing. Pretty powerful stuff. All right, verse three, verse three, it says, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, which is again, the perfect spot to view it because the Mount of Olives, so there's the temple Mount, then there's like a valley, the Valley Kidron, where the Brook of Kidron is, if you've read about that in the Bible, then you go up the Mount of Olives and it's not like a giant mountain range you're going up, but rather you go up, you wouldn't think it was a mount, right? In, in, in At least in California terms, we have some big mountains here. <laughs> we wouldn't think of it like that. But anyway, you go up and then you could sit from the Mount of Olives and see across, see the temple. It's right there. It's at the edge of the city there. Um, so they're viewing it there. And Peter and James and John and Andrew are questioning him privately, telling us when, they ask, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of when all these things are going to be fulfilled? And the next question we want to ask to understand what Jesus says next is, what are they asking about, right? Are the disciples asking about the temple or are they asking about the temple and other stuff? Because if my interpretation of Mark 13, that Jesus is talking about the destruction of the temple and other greater future realities, which I think you'll probably agree with me on this, because as you read on, you'll be like, yeah, that's obviously talking about the second coming of Christ. Um I'd like to see that it's in the question too. It would just help that interpretation. I mean, it's possible Jesus answers more than what they ask. But there are some indications here that they're asking about not only the temple, right? When will these things be? Well, that would be the destruction of the temple Jesus just predicted. In all the gospels where they ask this type of question, it's worded differently, but it's always in response to Jesus predicting the destruction of the temple. So they're clearly connecting it going, hey, tell us more about this destruction of the temple. But I'm going to suggest there's a lot more going on. And I'll give you several reasons to think there is. And to think it's natural to think that there's more. Um, verse 4 says, um, when are all these things going to be fulfilled? What's the sign for when, sorry, when all these things are going to be fulfilled? Now that phrase, all these things, all these things, it does seem to imply there's more than just the destruction of the temple. They're asking about generally future messianic prophecy. Now, if you can zoom out for a second and remember the attitude of the disciples when Jesus is walking the earth, they're looking at Jesus and seeing um, that he's the fulfillment of all the messianic prophecies, which is true, but they think the timing is now. So even after the ascension, they're like, will you now set up your kingdom? In Acts chapter one, they're like, will you now set up your kingdom? This is, this is something they're expecting. They see all messianic prophecy as, boom, it's all going to happen at once. That is their perspective. I don't think anybody's going to argue with, with me on this, right? They think it's all going to happen at once. They were confused as to how the suffering stuff worked together with the ruling and reigning stuff, and they tried to figure that out, and they didn't do a great job with it before Christ. But they thought it was all going to happen at once. So when they say, you know, not only when will the temple be destroyed, but they say, when will all these things be fulfilled? That implies they're talking about messianic prophecy in general. And Jesus' answer covers those things as well. In addition to this, there's the word fulfilled. The word fulfilled. Now, um, I'm not a Greek scholar. Um, and if you guys think I'm a, I'm a scholar or even have a PhD, you are mistaken. I just try to study hard, <laughs> try to present content that has been vetted to the best of my ability. Uh, but according to R.T. France, who would be a scholar on, in, who's relevant to the topic, who's written one of, the, one of the best commentaries on Mark, at least from a sc scholarly standpoint, um, R.T. France, <clears throat> and while I don't agree with his interpretation of Mark 13 entirely, I think we agree mostly with today's content, so I'll tell you that. R.T. France says that the word here used for fulfilled is suntaleo, <clears throat> suntaleo, that's, at least that's the lexical verb form, but it's often, quote, a technical term for the end time. So R.T. France also sees not only the, the all these things here, but the idea of being fulfilled. These are things that are embedded in their question to Jesus that imply that Jesus is answering more than just the destruction of the temple. He's answering the question of messianic prophecy as a whole, as a whole. And what was the thing they were anticipating the most with messianic prophecy? It certainly wasn't the cross. Jesus had to like hammer that in that that was a reality. They were expecting Jesus to rule and reign. They were expecting his kingdom to come sovereignly. And so everything in Mark 13, almost everything, at least everything we're covering today, it serves to dispel the idea that Jesus is about to reign and rule. And when you see it in that context, you're like, wait a minute. So when he's talking about wars and rumors of wars, these are about delays. This isn't about fulfillment. This is about delay. Interesting. So this is um, also supported, uh, I already mentioned that, it's by their view of seeing Messiah doing everything at once. So of course they're asking about everything at once. But his answer is laboring to show that there's more than one event. There's a long delay. This is consistent with Jesus' other teachings. He, in his parables, he talks about how <clears throat> the master, like, entrust to people with talents then he goes on for a long journey or he's you know the the, the um 
the, the virgins with the oil in their lamps, how there's like this long delay. There's just this long delay. There's a master who, who says, my, my master is, or there's a, a servant who's like, my master delays and he starts beating his fellow servants. You see, there's just this like, he's trying to get into their hearts that there's a long delay. I think Jesus is laboring to show us there's a difference between the first coming and the second coming. And there is a long delay between the two. <clears throat> so Jesus is answering about more than one season of time ultimately. Now, this is a big deal. This is probably where I want to, I want to hammer things home a lot because I think of, I think this passage and these verses have been mistaught and misunderstood, at least in some circles that I have traveled in, right? As a, as a, a Calvary Chapel pastor, I'm not, I don't think Calvary Chapel does everything perfect. I, I like Calvary Chapel. I, if I moved to a new town, I would look for a Calvary Chapel and consider attending there first, probably. Um, but we got to face the music sometimes. And there's going to be some music facing over the next few weeks for, for my fellow Calvary Chapel guys. I think you'll appreciate it because one thing that Calvary Chapel would say is that, man, we, we want the word of God. We want the word of God more than anything else. So let's get that. So this is a big deal. It took me time to realize this. My belief is that verses 5 through 13 that we're about to read and, and go through, verses 5 through 13, all these red letters, that these are not signs of Jesus' coming. They are expressly things that do not mean Jesus is coming. These are things you should not say are signs of his coming. Let this sink in. Jesus is not giving us a way to predict his coming based upon world events, at least not in 5 through 13. In 14 and on, he will give us some stuff. Next week, we'll talk about things that might be signs and how to understand them, at least different ways of viewing them. But right now, it's a list of things that aren't signs. These are things that don't mean Jesus is coming. It's a warning against premature messianic expectations. Why does he do this? <clears throat> because it's like we're like addicted to trying to like sniff the wind and predict the coming of Jesus. To like download an earthquake app and find out how many earthquakes are going on in the world and, and be like, well, they're increasing, you know? And, and then say, and like hint at, and I see this all the time, especially recently. Recently, there's like a new genre of YouTube, as I mentioned before, of prophets <laughs> prophets who give these vague they, they have these great titles right and because i know all about titles and thumbs right these really clickable titles and thumbs like god's word for us right now an urgent prophetic message and then you watch like a 40 minute video and the guy's just mostly saying very non-specific things that you're like those are just things that are literally true always why are you calling it an urgent prophetic message i don't understand but they're basing it off of little little mathematical algorithms and Oh man, it gets me going, you guys. I don't see this in scripture. I just don't. And I know, anyway, that there's a longer discussion we should have about this stuff. But I'll just say this. I'm going to predict, predict, not prophesy. I'm going to predict that this is going to get way worse in the next several years. Um, you see, we're coming to a time where we will literally be at the actual 2,000 year mark from the actual coming of Christ the first time. His, I mean, 2,000 years ago today, Jesus was a carpenter in Nazareth. And in a few years... Jesus was actually beginning his actual open ministry, his, the baptism with John and the walking with the disciples. And then just shortly thereafter, the crucifixion and then the resurrection and then Pentecost and then 70 AD when, when the destruction of the temple comes. And we are going to have a massive number of people trying to predict the future based upon just the correlation of 2000 years from those dates. It's just going to happen. It, people are just people. They're inev it's inevitable. I don't see any scripture that says it has to be that way. I don't. And so let me just be on record. Jesus can come back at any time. But for the massive number of people that will take advantage of other people's tick itchy ears to prophesy the coming of Christ, oh, well, 2028 will be there, or 2030 is going to, 2032, 33, that'll be, that'll be where it's going to be heightened for sure. And then we'll have specifically Passover of, of 2032, Passover of 2030, 2033. These are different dates people have for when they think Jesus was actually crucified. So you know, th between 30 and 33, we're probably going to have this like massive amount of weird predictions that um, Jesus might come back, but don't act like you can predict it. <laughs> but here we go. Here comes some more warnings. Um, you can tell this is like a pet peeve of mine. So I, I hope I'm not allowing my own irritation to come across in my Bible teaching in a negative way. But there it is anyways, because that's how, that's just what we're facing today. And it's, a, it's the opposite of what Jesus says. Let's look at it now. Verse five, Jesus says, in response to the question, what are the signs? What do we look for? He says, see to it, no one misleads you. You see, the first thing on Jesus' mind for us, on his heart for us, when it comes to the second coming, is don't let people mislead you. That's the first thing. You need to have your critical thinking radar up when people are talking about the second coming. 
because this is an area we're prone to be misled on. We do have a real coming of Christ. And this causes us to be more gullible when people are talking about it. Um, it's a potential danger. So it's safe to say that um, Jesus knew many would be misleading people and you need to be reading what he says next. This will safeguard you. He says, many will come in my name saying, I am he and will mislead many. This is probably the worst type of misleading that can go on. This is definitely the worst. These are actually false Christs, people who pretend to be Jesus, but they're not. Um, and <clears throat> Let, let's talk about this. This was in the first century. This was pervasive. There were lots of false messiahs that showed up in the first century, especially. Um, that was absolutely true. But it's definitely going on today in big numbers. Um, the World Mission Society Church of God is one example of a group that has false messiahs, a guy who they say is the Christ, right? Um, on Song Hong, right? The world that, That's a fast, fast growing cult. Like they're not that huge, but the speed at which they grow and the aggressiveness of their behaviors is scary. The Jehovah's Witnesses claim that Christ already came back. So Jesus predicted them here. There's a guy in Mexico right now claiming he's Jesus, has a following. Um, and the Church of Almighty God, you may not have heard this. They're in China. There's a group called the Church of Almighty God who has a female Jesus, supposedly. And they're not only in China, they're making inroads into India. And the Baptist churches in India have been rising, raising the alarm saying, guys, we just want everyone to know these are not Christians. Like they're, they're pretending to be Christians. They're trying to deceive you and they have a female Jesus, like an actual lady who, a Chinese lady who's supposedly the, the new Jesus. There's a cult in Siberia. You may have heard about this guy. This guy, he grows his hair long. <laughs> it's so funny when they try to like grow their hair out to try to like look like the Hollywood versions of Jesus. <laughs> um, anyway, <clears throat> so there's a cult in Siberia. The guy calls himself Viserion, says he is the new coming of Christ and he has thousands of people who worship him, who go to his who live in his commune, right? They actually, he controls, he's like a little monarch of a commune, thousands of people just arrested a few months ago by the government there in Siberia. Um, for what reasons, I don't know. So this should be no surprise to us. Like, basically it works like this. If someone says that they're the coming of Christ, that's how you know they're not. What do I mean? Well, we'll get, we'll get here more later, but here's the short version, right? Here's a little preview for what we're going to cover in, in future weeks. Jesus says, don't listen to these people because when the son of man comes, when his second coming is, is going to happen, everyone's going to know it. The, like lightning shining from the east to the west, everyone will know it. So he just says, like, if anyone tells you it, he's here or there, don't go, don't listen. Basically, it's kind of like this. Imagine if somebody was outside your home and then they come banging on your door and they're like, oh my goodness, you, you have to see this. And you go, what is it? And they said, an atomic bomb just went off in your front yard. Do you even need to look? To know this person's just wrong because if an atomic bomb had gone off in your front yard you would well not only you'd you'd be dead but no one would be able to tell you about it no one would need to tell you about it you would know already you would know already no one needs to tell you about the second coming there's no announcement that needs to happen christ comes everyone sees it boom it's, it's there so anybody who's like he's already come it's a lie based on the words of jesus i have talked to people who've been part of cults i talked to a guy who's part of a gnostic group here in LA and we sat down and talked and I read him I read through Jesus's own teachings about his coming and because he was saying we have a secret place we gather I can't really tell you about it Jesus we channel Jesus he comes there too and he tells us special things show me a notebook with incoherent scribbles on it it was just the saddest just demonic thing going on there just of confusion and and I read to him the words of Jesus on this stuff and it was perfect because it was so beautiful how Jesus's words actually refuted this modern um, cult. This is what we need. We need the prediction of Jesus warning us. If they if they say that they're Jesus, they're not. <laughs> it's, it's that easy. Now, this is a crazy prediction. People miss this, but here in Mark chapter 13, there is an actual prediction, an amazing prediction. You would think it would be an arrogant prediction if anybody normally said it. He actually says people are going to come in his name claiming to be him and that they're going to actually start movements. Now, Think of how unlikely this is in the first century. In the first century, you have a Jew who doesn't have a massive worldwide following. He's got a group of believers who's significant for the area, but not worldwide. He's just another Jewish Messiah type guy. And he makes a prediction in the first century that there's going to be a whole bunch of people in the future, not just pretending to be the Messiah, but pretending to be him, specifically him. Now, anybody else making this prediction, they would be wrong. In fact, he even says they'll mislead many, which means they'll have followings. They'll be, they'll be 
groups of people who have a, who are a significant number of people following someone pretending to be Jesus. This is a massive prediction about the future, and it has absolutely come to pass over and over and over again, as there have been countless people claiming to be Jesus. There's literally a Wikipedia page you can go look up right now of people who are currently claiming to be Jesus or have in the in the past that we know of, and. <clears throat> I just want to pause for a minute and say, look, there's more than one prediction in this passage. The destruction of the temple is an interesting prediction that <clears throat> that does, in fact, come to pass. And if you can make a case for the early dating of Mark, then it's a really strong, uh, very strong thing because it's so detailed. <clears throat> you know, every stone be torn apart. But verse 6 offers another prediction that I would argue you, you, you can't. A late date of Mark doesn't even help you get away from this one. If you're a skeptic, you have to honestly say, the guy predicted people would pretend to be him and would start followings and be successful. And that's happened over and over again. It's happening right now today. I think that's amazing. We just miss this stuff because we just read it and don't think about it sometimes. <clears throat> I think that's pretty awesome. So, <coughs> pardon me. So yes, um, false Christs, um, accurate prediction. They're going to say, I'm he. So how do you know it's a false Christ? One, Jesus gives you a list of things that don't mean it's coming. We're going to talk about that in a second. And two, the nature of the real coming of Messiah rules out every everybody claiming to be him because no one will have to tell you. It's like a bomb going off in your front yard. No one has to tell you, hey, a giant bomb went off in your front yard. Everyone will see. Every eye will see every, every, uh, every single person. So today we're going to focus on number one, things that don't mean Jesus is coming. And that starts in verse seven. Here we go. Here is probably one of the most frequently misused verses, this one and the next one, that I see in Mark 13, in my opinion. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Do not be frightened. Those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. I think I had to read this over and over before I just realized that it's not the end. Wait, wars and rumors of wars are going to happen, but they're not the end. World War I, people thought Jesus has got to be coming back real soon. Why? Is that because of something that Jesus taught? Not really. World War II, same thing. The Cold War, same thing. This thing's, that we keep predicting these things, and we don't learn from either our own experience of being wrong or from what Jesus actually said. There's going to be wars. There's going to be rumors of wars. This is not yet the end. Then in verse 8, he says, for nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Oh, well, Mike, nations are rising up against one another. Look, the Middle East is like a powder keg right now, which, you know, and over the years I've heard these claims. Jesus is coming back soon. And I'm like, but wait a minute. There's going to be these things, but that's not yet the end. There will be earthquakes in various places. There's going to be earthquakes. Mike, there's a lot of earthquakes. The big one's coming. You know, Jesus is coming too. And earthquakes are a sign of his coming. Where is that in scripture? And I know what you're thinking. I'll come to Revelation in just a second and give you my two cents on that. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. The beginning of birth pangs. So let me let me give, give some pushback to my own view here. Um, for those who think that kingdoms rising up and earthquakes in various places, and, and you could add famines, pestilences, as you read Mark, uh, Matthew and Luke, all three of the different accounts, you get all of these types of things being mentioned. Um, I'm going to suggest they're not signs of his coming. Like the, the pandemic is not evidence that Jesus is coming soon. I don't think it is. And one reason why is because um, the book of Revelation, when it does talk about these things happening at the end times, they're on a scale that's not just, ooh, it's worse than before. That's not, that's not the standard. It's not, ooh, okay, well, it's a world war. There's lots of nations involved. That's not the standard. It's when all of these things happen at once in quick succession, Right then, you know this is this this would be if you have a premillennial view like I do. If you tend to look at those things as being more, more now this is now this is where we get real in house. Okay, not all Christians. Okay, more people agree on the millennium than agree on the tribulation. I tend to think the tribulation is actually going to happen, like the seven year tribulation thing. I do tend to think that. I think that makes the most sense of the text. Maybe I'm mistaken on that. I'm super open to change my mind. But so many believers would look at that and say, no, we don't even think that's like an actual literal seven years. We think that just represents <clears throat> all of the stuff that's been going on through history. And so they wouldn't <clears throat> they wouldn't be looking for those predictions. But let's say that you're, you, you are a tribulation person. You think there's a real tribulation. The tribulation looks nothing like the pandemic that we're going through right now. The tribulation doesn't look like World War I or II. In fact, the fact that those have happened in our past tell us those are not proof that it's happening now. We need to be wise. 
we need to be reasonable and recognize that the types of things we're looking at is not just like a big earthquake, but like it would be every earthquake wouldn't matter compared to this one. That that's how big it would be, you know, from Revelation. We're talking about like a third of the a third of the planet suffering death because of the the things that are going on. And so when we try to like get there through predictions and go, ooh, if I smell it coming, we we just we've been wrong over and over again, Christians. We've been wrong because we didn't listen to Jesus. Now others would push back and say, well Mike Okay, fine. So maybe Jesus is warning about earthquakes and nations here and all that. But look, he says these are the beginning of birth pangs. And I've heard pastors teach this. That means that they're signs. So birth pangs are a sign that it's about, you're about to have labor. Or you're in labor. You're about to have a baby. And so the baby here is is, is um, the second coming, perhaps. And the birth pangs are signs. So maybe verse 7 gives us things that are not signs. But verse 8 gives us things that are signs. Or some would have this view. So right, when you hear rumors of wars... And, and wars, don't be frightened. Those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. You can't tell me that, that this is means they're not signs. Like You can't tell me that this doesn't mean they're not signs. There you go. Anyway, you know what I mean. <clears throat> I think verse 7 is secure here, but some would say verse 8, no. Nation rises against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Okay, but the problem with, with your view, if your view is that these are signs, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, is that he just said there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and how it's not a sign. And now he's saying nation will rise against nation. That's just another way of saying the same thing. And it is a sign now. But there's another issue. And this is the idea of birth pangs. We assume that if, if there's birth pangs being mentioned, then that means the delivery is soon. That's not how they used the term. Romans 8.22 uses it again. Birth pangs, right? Labor pains. But it has nothing to do with any sort of soon fulfillment. Paul says that we know that creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Now, in context, you're welcome to look at Romans 8 in full, read the whole thing. But in context, Paul's saying the sufferings of creation, right? We're talking about things like earthquakes and pains and all that suffering stuff. He's even talking about the same kinds of things that, that Jesus is speaking of in his passage. But he describes it as having been happening since creation until now. So, even if you're a young earth creationist, or if you're old earth, and I don't care which one you are personally, but whichever view you have there, you're looking at a very long time of birth pains. You can't look at birth pains and think, well, maybe in the next 30 years, maybe in the next 50 years, because at minimum, we're talking thousands and thousands of years of birth pains. It's not a prediction. That's what I'm saying is that when Jesus mentions here in Mark 13, birth pains, that doesn't mean these are predictions of what will come soon. That's not what it means. And um, verse 8 there. It just means that these are not the actual baby. These are the pains that will eventually, you know, lead to the baby. But but in, the, in, in a biblical terminology here, birth pains can last thousands and thousands of years. So at minimum. All right, verse 9, as we go on. He says, be on your guard for they will deliver you to the courts and you'll be flogged in the synagogues. And, and now flogged in the synagogues. This was normal. This was where floggings took place. The Jews had, they didn't have the ability to kill you, but they could flog you. And they would have court rulings, local rulings in synagogues. And then they would flog people there. So that's just where that would take place. You will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. The gospel must first be preached to all the nations. So they're looking for the second coming of Christ. And he wants to point them to suffering and witnessing. That's what they need to do first. Be on your guard, he says. They're expecting a ruling, reigning Messiah. They're expecting a utopian, messianic kingdom to come soon. And Jesus dispels that image, explains that it's a long ways out. I mean, how long does it take to have wars and rumors of wars? And, and as you read other places, famines and pestilences, kingdoms against kingdoms. Like these things take years and years and years and years. In other words, it's going to be quite a ways out. What they need to set their eyes on is not, not the messianic kingdom that's going to rule in the earth, but rather suffering and witnessing and being on their guard that they're willing to go through that sort of thing. That's the thing. So there's no utopian fantasy being taught here about the soon messianic kingdom. Um, instead, they're going to have to be ready for suffering. They'll be punished in courts, synagogues, and by governors and kings. Um, the idea here is that leadership will be against them. They're expecting the Messiah to rule over the kings of the earth, which will happen at the second coming. But he's explaining that that's not what's happening now. Even the leaders of the earth, even the powerful ones will come against you as the church. Doesn't mean every leader. Doesn't mean we want to create a persecution complex in our hearts or something weird like that. But it is a warning to be ready for it. And persecution has been nonstop 
you know, at least planetary, planet, planet wide, there's always been Christians somewhere being persecuted. Um, right now, there's tons of Christians suffering great persecution. Not me. I don't claim persecution. <laughs> um, now I'm talking about real persecution where they have to be on their guard. They have to be ready. Um, but what's cool is this. When Jesus talks about our suffering, he talks about the purpose of it. And he says, as a testimony to them. Now, if you live in a place where governors and kings and leadership is persecuting Christians, these leaders are the least likely to hear the gospel and the people in their courts are the least likely to ever hear the gospel. Uh, like in China, the people that China works the hardest to keep from hearing the Christian message are the people in government employ. They even make churches a commit. There's what's called a for self church in China. At least this was a few years back. I don't know what the current rules are. So maybe 15 years ago, the for self church was a church that had to um, <clears throat> basically one of the commitments, the four self commitments they had to make was that they would not evangelize government workers. So if they shared the, the, the gospel with a, a police officer or with an employee of the government of any kind, then, then they had violated this and they could lose their, uh, their freedom to have a church at all. And then they would go underground. This is why there's still a lot of underground churches. You, you can affirm, at least back then you could, you could become an approved church by the state, but you had to do it by making some compromises that most Christians think aren't, they aren't willing to make. Um, and it becomes kind of controversial, the churches that did make the compromise. It's, it's a challenging situation. What I think is interesting is that Jesus says it's as a testimony to them. So these leaders who generally never hear the gospel, like say in China, the workers don't generally hear the gospel. When you are brought before them and when they're flogging you and they're punishing you, you take that opportunity to preach Christ. That's powerful because it's going to get you in more trouble. But it's also the chance to preach the gospel to the people that the enemy is trying to work the hardest to keep them from hearing it. And so Paul did this when he gets brought before leaders in the book of Acts. We read about how he preaches Christ to them. He actually tells them the gospel. Oh, Festus, I'm glad I'm before you today. And then he tells him the gospel. And, he, and you know, we read about uh, one of the leaders saying, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And um, I think this is, these are powerful things. The mission of the church then is to preach the gospel to preach the gospel, to preach the gospel. That's the mission of the church, to tell people about Christ. And that's not the mission of the Sunday service. It's the mission of the church, the people. It's not just the mission of the pastor. It's the, it's the mission of the church, the people. This is, this is our focus. This is our mission. Good reminder for you to be on that the gospel needs to be front and center and foremost in your life, that it's worth your life. To just share the gospel is worth suffering and dying for. This is a radical thing. Uh, if the gospel's not true, then it's a crazy thing. If the gospel's true, then it's the most plain and sensical thing on the planet. Of course, seeing somebody come into eternal life is worth me losing this temporary life and entering into my eternal glory. It's like not even that hard of a decision to make, you know, and, um, and that's what we need to focus on. Then in verse 11, Jesus goes on. <clears throat> He says, um, when they arrest you, and this is a controversial verse, so at least I'm going to make it controversial. Uh, verse 11, when they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand what you are about to say, but, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Now, there are some who think that the Holy Spirit doesn't um, give us words today. Um, the cessationists, now there's... It's funny because there's like the continuationists, the cessationists. So the continuationists think that the gifts of the Spirit are continuing today. The cessationists, they believe that the gifts of the Spirit have ceased. Like generally they'll say after the closing of the canon of Scripture, after a revelation's written and we've got the full canon, or maybe after it's been uh, made available to the church, that's when the gifts stop happening. Um, <clears throat> now there are some, some of us are a little closer to the middle than out the extremes. And I, I don't tend to be the continuationists who's way out here. I tend to be a little more in this area, if that makes any sense. But... <clears throat> the, the cessationists who are out here, some of them, not all, some of them will say that one of the reasons why the Lord would never give you words, the Holy Spirit would never give you words inspired by the Spirit to speak is because then those words would automatically be scripture. And you would have to write those down and you would have to add to the Bible. I've heard this complaint many times um, and I've never really clicked with it. Like I understand how it feels like it's a real good complaint against um, continuationists. But it seems to conflict with what Jesus actually says because he predicts that his disciples, his followers, which which it seems he's talking to more than just the four guys here. It really does seem like he's talking to a lot more than that. And, and I think you have to say he is actually because his prediction is about much more than just their experiences. And so he predicts to them and to us 
that when you're drugged before courts, when if you're a Chinese um, Christian who's drugged before the courts, that the Holy Spirit will give you, will inspire you and give you words to speak at that exact moment. Now, at least if you're that kind of cessationist, this isn't a possible thing. It's like this doesn't happen. This prediction is just can't happen in our lives. So I'm going to say this. You can have the Holy Spirit give you something to tell somebody. It doesn't mean it's scripture now. It doesn't mean it's for the whole church for all time. You can be led by the Spirit in a moment. It doesn't mean that you are have to be led to write scripture or record it down for all people for all time. And I think that what Jesus taught here is, is consistent with that view and refutes the other view. It just seems to be the case. Um, yeah. So, so persecution's coming, but our priorities be a witness and don't worry about how you'll do it. God will help you because this is what he's called you for. At that moment when persecution, real persecution comes, the Lord's going to give you the ability to stand up and speak the right thing and say the right thing and know what to share to be his witness. Um, it's a beautiful thing. Precious in the, in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saints. Verse 12 goes on. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. So these verses here are talking about um, another sad reality. They're expecting, again, messianic utopia. Instead, they're told they're still going to experience wars and, and earthquakes and difficulties and all that, and persecution and even betrayal from loved ones for the name of Christ. And this does happen in times of heightened persecution where they're actually interrogating people to find out where the Christians are meeting and, and, and where are they and who which ones are them. This does happen in times of heightened persecution where they're actually betrayed by their own family and end up being put to death. Um, I've never experienced this, thank God, and, and many of us today have not, but some of our brothers and sisters today are. There are them today. Today, there are Christians being murdered in this very same way for their faith. Verse 14 goes on. Um, oh, let me, I'm sorry, let me observe one thing here. He who uh, uh, endures to the end will be saved. So again, we get the sense of a delay. They're expecting messianic kingdom, utopia, long delay, wars, all this other stuff, persecutions. And your job is just endure to the end. You just hang on, hang on, hang on. You, I will save you. You will be saved. This is like the uh, the message to the persecuted church in Revelation where he tells them um, that if, if, they, if, they, if they're faithful unto death, he'll give them the crown of life. So that death is nothing. Death is just a passing... You're just passing through it on your way to life. And a um, beautiful thing. So here's where I want to hit home, if I can. If you have been around the pastors, the leaders, who have said and taught, or maybe you've been one of them, maybe you've taken advantage of going on to the news to Google weather results and say, ooh, the weather is getting crazy. It's hotter than it's ever been. It's colder than it's ever been. It's more hurricanes than ever before. And therefore, the time is coming and you're creating all this expectation based upon things like that. If you're looking at wars and you're talking about the roiling nature of nations and their potential fights in the future, and you're then using that to predict the coming of Christ, can I say, please stop. Jesus specifically used those exact examples to say these things don't mean I'm coming. Now, Christ might come at any time, but we are just, and I say we, I mean my own church tradition. We are guilty of overstating and overreading into things the coming of Christ because it's exciting. I want to see Christ come. It is exciting, but I can't do it based on reversing the very statements he's made, like changing what Jesus has said. Yeah. And, and, and um, let's look real quick at another thing, a verse I wanted to share with you to push back against those who, again, are like, but wait a minute. No, Mike, there's, things are going to happen. They're going to happen in the last days. There'll be an increase in these things. In uh, Mark 13, 19, it says, for those days will be a time of tribulation. This is now talking about actual things that will happen in the end times, such as has not occurred since the beginning of creation, which God created until now and never will. It's going to be so epic that there will be no comparison. to. You won't be looking at your weather app to try to count how many hurricanes there are that year. Like, it, it won't be like, well, there was a really big earthquake. Like, remember when Pompeii was destroyed by a crazy volcanic eruption? That wasn't the end, right? Like, these are just, these are things that happen. We have crazy tsunamis, crazy earthquakes. We have pandemics, which this is not the worst thing our world has faced. It's weird. <laughs> I'll give you that. Um, 
So what I'm saying is that I am firmly a believer in the coming of Christ, firmly a believer that the things he's predicted are going to happen in our future. I just honestly don't know if it's going to happen in five years or 500 years. And neither do you, right? Neither do you, but Israel's a nation. Well, we'll talk about the fig tree, Israel nation. We'll talk about that here in, in Mark 13 as we continue going through this series. Yeah, that's just, it's not the case. And that, and that fig tree, that misunderstanding of the fig tree is what actually led uh, beloved Pastor Chuck Smith to offer his most embarrassing moment um, in predicting the coming of Christ. Uh, well, not prophesying it, but he did predict it. And we're going to talk about that openly. I, I've never heard anybody talk about it. And it, I think it bugs a lot of us. <laughs> Coverage Temple pastors, and we're like, wait, he did what? <laughs> yeah, it happened. And we're going to talk about it um, as we go through here. Uh, not to assassinate his character, but to give us some sobriety and some humbleness about how we approach um, eschatology. So yes, the, the, it's coming. Um, the issue for you today is the same as it was for the early church. Are you ready to face persecution? And are you ready to face things that aren't perhaps the kind of extreme persecution Jesus talked about? They're just life being uncomfortable because you're a Christian. When you stand on Christian things, Christian claims, Christian truths, are you willing to stand and be misunderstood and be disliked? Maybe not persecuted, but disliked, that sort of thing. I feel like soft persecution is is pretty effective in discouraging people from sharing their faith and from being open about being a Christian and from slowly whittling away at their Christian faith because they're just generally, they know that the world around them doesn't approve of them and it's not fun. It's not nice. And all I want to tell you guys is this, like Jesus, like straight up is like, they're going to hate you. Like it's, and, it, and this isn't where you're like, let me talk about our response to this in a second, but basically you need to be ready for this as a Christian. There's going to be people who disapprove of you because they've been wired to do so, whether it's their, their, the control of Satan in their lives, right? Which they're probably not aware of. Or if it's, if it's just the fact that in our world around us, there's a slow targeting of Christian principles and Christian beliefs and, and, and then attaching the word bigot to all of those things. And let me talk about a response to this though. As a Christian, if you do think you're being persecuted, this is not where you point the finger and you go, persecuting, you're persecuting me, and you get all mad at them. Jesus is like, love them, bless those who persecute you, pray for those who spitefully use you. This is, this is, we are to react in such love to those who dislike us and who write hateful comments to us. This is, this is stuff where we, it's our chance to shine, right? Because even the Gentiles love those who love them, right? But we're going to show the love of Christ, where he's on the cross saying, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. Instead, he's not like, woe is me. Look at how persecuted I am, everybody. Um, you know, I'm honoring Christ and they're coming down on me. No, no, no. Even Stephen, the first martyr, he's like, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's, it's a beautiful thing when an actually suffering persecuted Christian responds with no malice and just love, actual love and care for those people who are causing them harm. This is beautiful and it's absolutely our call and it will show them that we are true followers of Christ and that there's something here and um, yeah, it's going to be beautiful um, and I I hope for God's glory that the church is ready for these things and able to do it if you can do it in the little areas if you can do it when someone can can calls you a bigot because of your views on homosexuality because you're going to hold to what scripture says and you can respond in grace grace and kindness and, and balance and wisdom um, when when someone um, you know accuses you of whatever, right? That this is this is not a victim moment. This is a chance to shine the love of Christ to that person. And so that needs to be our attitude towards those things. Um, let's let's pray. I hope this has helped you guys. Like really, please give me feedback in the comments. Has it helped you? Have you been exposed to people who have like been giving you like, like did you download the earthquake app and you're like looking on your phone to see like, there sure are a lot of earthquakes. Like, is this a sign? And then you slowly realize that Jesus is like, hey, don't, don't do all that. Don't do all that. Those aren't the signs. Next week, we'll talk about things that are actually signs as we get into Mark 13, verse 14 and on. Talk about the abomination of desolation and different views on that. And I'm looking forward to getting into it with you. For now, we all just need to get better at ignoring certain YouTube <laughs> YouTube videos. <laughs> all right, let's pray. Uh, Father, we, we ask for great wisdom. We pray that we could absorb the words of Christ, not only in uh, not being led astray by being overly excited about the coming of Christ that we're trying to look into things and predictions and turning things into signs that aren't um, blood moons and all this kind of stuff. We pray not only that, Lord, but we pray that you give us a heart of love towards those who might mistreat us. Let us be those who love our enemies, who love those who make themselves our enemies, like truly love them. 
Help us to have that real, true, compassionate heart. Any bitterness in our hearts towards those people would just be set aside, that we would let vengeance be yours, Lord, and we would bless them and we would do, be, be kind to them in hopes that they might turn and they might come to Christ. Lord, let us not be self-righteous thinking that we're just, we're right about all this stuff, but rather let us actually be a follower of Christ in emulating his attitude towards those. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all, thank you so much for joining. Um, I For announcements, I have got a video coming out um, tomorrow and then another one the next day and the next day and the next day. You're going to need these short little clips from an interview I did with Elisa Childers on the topic of progressive Christianity. That's coming out for, I think it's 18 videos, maybe 17. And every day for like half a month, you're going to be getting um, a bunch of videos put out one a day, little short ones that are on the topic of progressive Christianity. And if you guys are interested in more of this in time stuff, I did do a video a little while ago. I will put a link to it. I'll put it over here. I don't know. I like it there better. Um, that will be on um, dealing with end times predictions, like Harold Camping saying that Jesus was going to come back and people buying billboards and selling their houses to do it and advertise it and all that kind of weird stuff. And that'll be something you can check out later. Otherwise, thanks for joining. God bless you. Stick with me in the Mark series as we continue to do end time stuff in Mark 13. It's going to get hairy, but hopefully it'll be a huge blessing to you.